Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel, as well as the blackbrazildtoday.com blog, where I analyze Brazil from the perspective of race. So tonight I'm going to be taking a look at a topic that I've actually approached in, uh, in some ways in previous articles over the last, I don't know, maybe five to 10 years, whatever. As I said, you know, I have a wide range of uh, topics that just uh, look at this material, you know, from pers the perspective of how it works out in Brazil, according to race and color. So over the years, over the time that I have visited and then eventually lived in Brazil, I always saw and I always noticed that when you go into poorer neighborhoods, you know, people, you know, skin colors tends to be, you know, darker. When you get into the ritzy upper crust neighborhoods, it, the, the skin color tends to be, you know, lighter. You know, even when we don't say, you know, uh, some Brazilians you may not even consider as being white, but, you know, what they consider Brazilian white and what is actually white, you know, I, I, when I say actually white, I just mean, People who would be considered white wherever they are, wherever they are in Brazil, because, you know, Brazil has a large percentage of uh, people with fair skin who aren't necessarily white. But in Brazil, they're considered such. But it seems like whatever city I go to, I notice that same pattern. You you go to Salvador Bahia, which is a, a favorite like tourist spot for you know, particularly African-Americans who are interested in seeing, getting a black cultural experience from Brazil. A lot of people like to go to Salvador and in Salvador, you know, the average neighborhoods, the poor neighborhoods are going to be primarily populated by people with brown and darker skin. Whereas the more ritzy uh, areas of the city are going to be primarily populated by people who are white or consider themselves to be white. And Salvador is considered to be a vastly majority black brown city, right? So I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 percent of the population could be, be considered white. But the concentration of those people who consider, consider themselves white in the more upper crust areas, they're clearly the majority in the, you know, the upper crust neighborhoods. You know, same thing goes on in Rio, Belo Horizonte or Sao Paulo, wherever you may be. Um in my years living in Sao Paulo, you know, I remember, you know, I worked for a English school and, you know, um, became really common where instead of having a classroom setting where students come to a school and everybody just sits there in your typical school setting. You know, I worked for schools where the teacher will get get sent to the household where they're going to be teaching the, you know, teaching English. And in two of those schools that I worked in you know, sending me all over Sao Paulo. I visited a lot of solidly middle class, uh, upper middle class neighborhoods. In some standards, you could say maybe upper class or, you know, lower upper class. But, you know, traveling all over Sao Paulo, you know, just teaching English classes, it showed me parts of Sao Paulo that I may not have seen if I was just living there. Uh, and I was just, you know, visiting different areas of the city on my own. You know, I saw you go to Sao Paulo. I mean, like I, said, I always say, it's like the New York of Brazil. There's a lot of money in Sao Paulo, right? But typically, whatever major city you go to in Brazil, uh, the higher the income, the higher the income of the neighborhood, the whiter it's going to be. Um, so this is something that I, I got to witness personally, just traveling all over to Brazil, you know, doing, you know, just just teaching these kids English in their homes, right? So then um, something, th there's always a comparative analysis between Brazil and the United States. Like, oh, well, just, you know, those racist things that happen in the United States, that doesn't, that doesn't happen in Brazil. But then when you, when you put the country under a microscope and look at it from a racial lens, it's like, well, <laughs> you guys may do things slightly different. But as I've said in a previous video, no matter what topic you look at, you get almost the same results. So there have been several studies that have come out over the years that show that even though Brazil cannot be considered anywhere near as segregated as the United States, it does have its own level 
of uh, <clears throat> we'll say a, a type of uh, racial segregation. It's just that as race is connected to class, as I said, the, the higher the income, the higher the the per capita uh, income of the neighborhood, the whiter that neighborhood is going to be. Um, you don't necessarily have in Brazil where you have poor white neighborhoods and poor black neighborhoods. You just have poor people and they tend to be darker skinned, uh, even though you have poor white people mixed in these areas as, as well. But, you know, there have been a number of articles that I've, I've uh to to explain this topic, there's been a number of articles that I've put out over the years. I'm going to mention a few of those as I go on through this article. Now, I like I, I stumbled across this piece like today, and I said, "Wow, I definitely have to do something about this story here because it's becoming uh you know a more a popular topic to discuss in Brazil." Because as I've said over the last ten fifteen years, with affirmative action policies. Uh, you have a larger percentage of Afro-Brazilians moving into these solidly middle class neighborhoods. And in the same way people react to them, you know, I did a piece, you know, it was about last week where people are uncomfortable seeing clearly black people on airplanes. The, the point is, in, in, in Brazil in general, the, the people who consider themselves white have long been accustomed to only seeing other white people in certain areas. You know, as I said, and when I first started traveling to Brazil, I would notice there were very few black people in the airports, either working there or catching a plane. Even today, uh, if you catch a domestic flight or even, you know, if you're traveling from Brazil to the United States, for example, you'll see very few black Brazilians on that plane. And, you know, as I was talking about this in a previous video, the reason is because of the social economic status of the black population. You don't see very many black people on the plane is because a lot of them can't afford to fly. Right. Um, when I first started going there, you didn't find a whole lot of black people, you know, driving cars that that's changing. You see a lot of black people with cars there. Things have changed a lot since I first started visiting the country in the year 2000. But you still see clear. uh separation of the population along lines of color and this just goes to show you don't need legalized segregation in order to let's say quote unquote keep certain people in their place right um i've said it again and again and again you know brazil likes to hold itself up as we're nowhere near as racist as the united states but even without any racial discriminatory laws they've managed to keep black brazilians from attaining a certain middle class standard that is simply not possible in some ways. Um, you'll find far more African Americans with middle class status than you will find of Brazil. And, you know, of course, that depends on what you define as being middle class, right? But in, you know, just in some of the material that I've read, it's like the, the middle class status of a lot of African Americans, it, for Black people, just would not be possible in Brazil, even though that is changing. It continues to change, but still a long ways to go uh, for, to see equal representation along color lines, uh, the further up people go to economic ladder. So the housing market is obviously something that, you know, you want to see how discrimination works. Look at, you know, where people live, look at the access that people have to certain neighborhoods. And, you know, that'll tell you a whole lot about the country. Um, as I said, I'm going to get into a few other articles that are going to back up some of the things that I found. This is an article I found today on an Instagram channel, and I called it, Are You Sure You Can Afford to Live in This Neighborhood? Racial Discrimination in, Racial discrimination in Brazil's Housing Market. This is what I decided to title this article. Um, so this was, I found this on an a Instagram page. I think it's called the Politica da Muria Negra, like, I don't know, Black women's politics, you could say. Um, does housing discrimination exist in Brazil? Again, you don't need racially segregation. You don't need open, uh, just blatant laws that keep one group of people here and another group of people there. You don't need that. As has been shown in the United States, you know, as during the 50s and 60s, when all the focus was on the Jim Crow South, people seemed to it was like forgotten that even though these laws didn't exist in the north, you still had very clear segregation in many cities. Like when I grew up in the city of Detroit, there's a long history of how the more black people moved into, into Detroit, the more white people who used to populate the city moved out to the suburbs. 
right, to the point where Detroit eventually became like an 86% black city. You know, that's that's a history that can't be denied. It's like you look in a lot of American cities and you had some of the same, you know, actions where more blacks coming in, more whites leaving the city. All right. So this it didn't necessarily work that way in Brazil, but you still see this this type of segregation where, OK, you got mostly white people over in this neighborhood because of the, of the higher income. And then you got the black, brown and white, the poor white, you know, in the poor in the neighborhoods. I mean, I challenge you go to any Brazilian city and, and check it out for yourself. I mean, it's kind of clear to me. So let me get into this. This is what the article was called, Uquie Hacismo Immobiliario, right? Like what is basically real estate racism, right? So again, this is taken from the Politica da Muria Negra Instagram page. I guess the uh, the creator, creator of the page is Nadia uh, Marinho. And in the comments on this topic, she, she writes, uh, the right to housing and property is constitutional. But as for us, we are still far from this reality talking about black Brazilians when renting or buying a property to black population encounters serious and numerous difficulties, uh, you know, hashtag for gentrification. They go into a little bit about Brooklyn and New York. Uh, there's a particular singer that's featured in this piece, Gireto a Propriedade, saying, you know, the right to property. Um, and curious thing, you have Brooklyn, this, you know, the what do you call it? The. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's uh, one of the boroughs, one of the cities in New York. And then there's also a Brooklyn in Sao Paulo. It's a neighborhood in Sao Paulo called Brooklyn, except with the I, they, they, instead of the L, L-Y-N spelled in New York, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Brooklyn in Sao Paulo is spelled L-I-N. So anyway, getting right along uh, to this piece. What does someone say here? Okay, so Silvia Jacinta oh, Ajibugado. So this lady is a lawyer. Ajibugado means lawyer. And she says, uh, this is very clear in the advertisements of the properties. The actors are always white people. It shows that the place is not for blacks. They already make a selection of people around here. This is what she's saying here. So this is something that I wanted to show just getting into the article uh, as people commented on this piece. Um, let me see advertisements of the properties. So when I use the keywords, Vinji Immobiladios, like sell real estate, right? These are some of the pictures that you'll find, you know, what they're talking about. Basically, she's saying that when you look at properties for sale or the advertisements in these real estate agencies, they're always going to use like a white family to advertise, it, you know, whatever housing is for sale. Okay. You have the white real estate agent for the most part, when you just when you look at the advertisements for a real estate, you're going to see it mostly represented by white real estate agents selling to a, you know, a white family. It's almost like, OK, black people don't buy houses in Brazil. So, you know, that's what she's saying here. Let me go back to this article. All right. Let me see here. Uh, OK, so the next one says another point is that the number of black agents, black real estate agents is low. Historically, the stimulus emanating is that property is not our right. So then again, when you look at the image of what a real estate agent is supposed to look like in Brazil or arguably, as she just said, you know, there are very few Afro-Brazilian real estate agents. So when you get images of real estate agents in Brazil, this is what you get. You know, what did I say here? Cohetor G. Imovis, you know, basically a real estate agent. So these are what the real estate agents look like in terms of what the advertisements look like. So when you look at this, what image do you get in terms of who's going to sell you a house? OK, uh, how did you go? OK, so you got a black woman represented here. But, you know, how far down did you got to go before you see a black face in these images in terms of, you know, people, you know, talking about the real estate business, whether they're real estate agents or they're selling homes. You know, what are the people supposed to look like that are buying these homes? And that's 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 the two points that these these commenters made on this particular article. OK. Let's see here. OK, so what is real estate racism? So this is somebody talking, Amanda Santos. She says, talking to an agent, he said my income wouldn't be sufficient for where I wanted to live. Detail, I did not show him my income. 
So he just assumed because she was black that she couldn't afford to buy a certain house in a particular neighborhood. OK. OK, these are some comments made. I'm going to talk a few a little bit about these comments here and then what was written here. Let me just keep going. So Gabi Oliveira is a popular YouTuber. She has close to 700,000 followers, and she talks a little bit about her experiences trying to buy a house. And she says to search for a house without letting the real estate person see my WhatsApp photo. Of course, you know, the WhatsApp uh, communication app. And she says, this is my world. She doesn't. So she's looking for a house. She's not going to let people see what her photo looks like because they're going to automatically assume. Ah, uh, it's a preta, no tame dinero, right? You know, this black woman doesn't have money. Uh, here is a woman who calls herself Preta na Italia, which means black woman in Italy. So what I get from that is that she was in Italy and then perhaps she's looking for a home in Brazil. So listen to what she says. This is her comment right here. And she says, I asked for information about an apartment. Uh, a real estate agent gave me very dry answers about it. When my white husband texted her, she gave him all the information she could and a little more. So listen to what she's saying there. You know, I've heard something similar in the United States. Uh, well, in just different scenarios, we've we've heard so many stories of how black people try to sell their homes and they're expecting to get a certain value for their homes. And they get offered. A, they get an offer much lower than what they expected. They change the faces. They totally eliminate the uh, the images of, of black presence in the house. They all get one of their white neighbors to pretend like they're selling the house and they put all pictures of white people and white families in the house. And all of a sudden thinking that this is a white family, they get a higher offer for the house. So we still see things like this go on. And I'm quite sure that same example, you might be able to find that in Brazil either uh, also. But what this woman is saying is that the real estate agent was real dry with her when she was inquiring about, a, you know, an apartment, but when her white husband did the same thing, it was just like, OK, let me show you everything I got. You know, this black woman doesn't have any money, but yet her husband, who she's married to, obviously he has money. That's the thought that they have. So the idea of who has money in Brazil and who does not. It's been going on for decades, if not centuries. So um, what did she say? She said at the time. This is a. Uh, Ana Livia Ribeiro. She is a lawyer working in real estate law and the author of the book, Racismo Estrutural e Aquisição da Propriedade, which means structural racism and the acquisition of property. She did this interview. Apparently, this is a uh, some type of a uh, real estate website. So she says, um, wait, let me just see who this woman is. So this is Ana Livia Ribeiro. And this is a topic that she's talking about, you know, just like racism in the uh, the real estate industry. This is her book. It's like structural racism and the acquisition of property, again, uh, by the author the, and the lawyer, Ana Livia Hibedo. So what is she saying here? She says, at the time of the search or searching for homes, we identify, identify a greater difficulty in renting the property to black people, especially in high standard places. Right away, there is a questioning of the economic capacity of that person that is not common with white citizens. And the same happens in buying and selling where blacks are pushed to more distant regions. Hmm. What does that say? It's like, OK, we're going to show you homes in a, a you know, a, you know, an area that's not as ritzy, you know, and they and a lot of downtown regions in Sao Paulo or Bela Belenazarchi or Rio, the more ritzy neighborhoods, you're not going to find a lot of black people in these neighborhoods. And what I find is that when you do come across black people, I've seen this everywhere you go. And this is the question that I have for black Brazilians. How do you plan on changing this dynamic when all of you seem to get this middle class status when you finally get there and you choose a white partner? which goes into the whitening process, which after a generation or two, everything you did to get to that position gets passed on to a whiter, you know, child. And, you know, it's, this is not even the point of this article today, but it's just something that I've noticed. Oftentimes when you do find black people, black Brazilians in more upper cross, upper cross neighborhoods, they're usually going to have a white partner. You know, <laughs> I'm not even going to touch it. I've, I've talked enough. I've talked enough about that topic in, uh, in other videos. So let's keep this moving. So this is what Ana Livia Hibedo said about, you know, real estate practices in Brazil and the difficulty black people have in getting housing, particularly when they have, you know, buying power. 
So now they're getting into the word gentrification. And in Portuguese, they call it gentrificação, right? And so they're getting into the origin of what this means. A lot of us are familiar with the word gentrification. Uh, the term is of English origin, gentry, which means of noble origin. As the periphery areas, the outskirts of cities, are formed without planning, often by invasions with absence of essential public services, for example, sanitation, lighting, etc., under a revitalization varnish, which can occur at any time in any area of the city and with the public interest, the gentrification occurs in specific locations, usually in the downtown region or areas with greater tourist potential, further valuing that region, increasing the value of the properties and consequently the cost of living of that region. OK, so that's a translation of this piece right here. Gentrification, gentrification versus racism. So here they're going to talk about what happened in Brooklyn. It's something that we're a lot of us are familiar with, with what's going on in Brooklyn. So I'm going to get into the translation of this piece right here. Gentrification versus racism says Brooklyn, New York was a neighborhood populated by blacks and poor immigrants. Today, the residents are white Americans. This is according to Paula Santoro, a professor of uh, the Department of uh, Architecture and Urbanism of the University of Sao Paulo and the coordinator of the Lab Cidade for Estadão newspaper. It happens that as the cost of living of that locality close related, closely related to the significant increase in real estate speculation, the former residents are practically expelled from that region and forced to reside in places more appropriate to their income. We've heard about this going on. I've heard a lot about this going on in Sao Paulo, right? The big issue with gentrification is that it becomes practically impossible to map the displacement of residents who have migrated from one region to another. And usually the receiving neighborhoods don't receive the same invest in investments as the gentrified ones. This fact can cause a racial segregation since the social economic change of the population in gentrified, gentrified areas tends to drive the black population away from these areas, promoting a significant change in race and income. OK, so they're exploring gentrification. Um, obviously, a lot of studies come out of the United States, but we can see the same pattern going on in Brazil when, uh, you know, a certain area of a city is. Is being un is under speculation for, you know, real estate development. This is a popular singer named uh, Luigi Luna, and she talked a little bit about her experiences, uh, you know, in the search for uh, for for a home in a particular neighborhood. So I'm going to get into what she says and we're going to continue to talk about the process of black people trying to find uh, homes in particularly upper crust neighborhoods. So real estate racism and structural racism. Oh, say so, so uh, Luigi Luna, she actually um she's been a she's been a popular singer out of uh, Bahia for I don't know how long she's been in the public, maybe five or six years. I could be wrong about that. I'm just she makes some very natural music. I'll call it very uh, inspirational music. Um, I have a couple of her CDs. She was recently the opening act when Alicia Keys took her world tour to Brazil. I think she did shows in Sao Paulo and shows in Rio. And Luigi Luna was actually the opening act for those shows. So this is her talking. She says, Looking for a house in my neighborhood, the police stop us with a gun pointed at us. My son of two years, my husband and the white real estate agent inside. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> you know, you, you I'm, I'm not sure if she's saying this happened in. She was looking for a house in her in the neighborhood she ended up moving to. And the police stopped her and had a gun pointed at her. Now. I did a story a couple of weeks ago. This uh, black American in Brazil says he was uh, pulled over. He was in an Uber and, you know, the police had him up against the wall with guns, you know, guns pointed. A lot of people <laughs> went to say, like, they think he was lying about that story. And honestly, I can't say whether he's lying or not. I'm going to just say that that's a very common occurrence, which is why I did something on the video. It's like, regardless of whether his story is true or it's not. It, being stopped in a car or in an Uber or whatever and being, you know, uh, frisked by police with guns, you know, pointed. That's just something you hear coming out of, you know, people's interactions with the military police in, in Brazil. It goes on all the time. So whether he's, his story is true or not, it doesn't matter. It's still true. 
So she continues, Luigi Luna, she continues. She says, because a black man with a white girl in the car in an okay neighborhood, she could only be getting robbed at home or being kidnapped. So even though, you know, uh, Luigi Luna is married to a black woman, I mean, married to a black man and they have a two-year-old child. She's just talking about, she's, she's, she knows that this is a common situation where a black man being with a white woman in a car in a ritzy neighborhood, oh, well, <laughs> she must be being robbed or getting kidnapped or something. There's even stories of how black men sometimes of they they fear being approached by police if their child happens to come out looking too white. Like, where'd you steal that baby from? A lot of crazy stuff you hear coming out of Brazil in terms of race. So she says we're all fine and we're all alive, what she said. So the article continues. Accustomed to our presence in up, upper scale or upscale neighborhoods for servitude, we have that real estate racism is also a cruel face of structural racism that relates to all aspects of the daily life of the black population. With housing, it's no different. So what they're talking about here, she says, accustomed to our presence in upscale neighborhoods for servitude is to say that if black men or women in a, are in a certain upper cross upper cross neighborhood it is expected that they're there as like a butler or the cleaning lady or the maid or you know the person who's in charge of the security at the gate if a black person is in one of these ritzy homes it's not expected that they live there they must work there and i, I got a piece that i want to i'm going to get into that a little bit later but this is something that you hear about all the time you know people are so accustomed that when they see black people in neighborhoods they must be there working because there's no way they could live in this possible in this neighborhood or apartment all right so with housing it's no different gathering evidence in these cases in order to file a lawsuit is not an easy job therefore making the black population aware of this reality is the beginning of a path to overturning these standards you know what she's saying is it is it's difficult to prove you know this type of discrimination you know um why do you think you were discriminated against and it's like you the the you know the 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 necessity of proving that something racist happened to you it falls upon the person who's making the accusation obviously right now going back gabi Oliveira again she is a popular youtuber uh, this is Gabi, has 665,000 subscribers. So she's been at it. I don't know how many years she's been in the game, but I've been knowing about Gabi G. Oliveira for a number of years. These are just some of the videos you find on her channel. Okay. So she says, looking for a house without letting the real estate person see my photo on WhatsApp. This is my world. Somebody asks her why. She says, because when they see the photo, uh, then all of a sudden the house is not available. So then I call and the if I call, you know, the house is available. So what she's saying is that if they see her picture associated with her WhatsApp profile and they see she's black, you know, this house isn't available. But if she just calls and she's on the phone, then maybe she'll have a chance of looking at the house and, you know, you know, I'm just seeing if that's a place she wants to live in. I mean, just think about what she said there. So this is... um. Just a piece that I wanted to present first, because there's a lot of good material that has come out recently just talking about how, I guess, you know, housing discrimination works in Brazil. Um, I would imagine that this is going to get worse because as you get more and more Afro-Brazilians who are climbing the social economic ladder, they're looking for homes that previously they might not have been able to afford. And so, you know, with that said, I want to get into a couple of the uh you know, some of these articles that, you know, speak to the same situation. You know, this is an article from 2018. It says, how could a Neguinha, you know, some people take Neguinha as, you know, a derogatory term. You know, this is how I, you, you could translate it when it's, when people see it as a racist term, then you, in some ways, it's equivalent to the N-word in, in the United States, in some ways. So he's, somebody, you know, this is the, the attitude that people have when they live in upper crust apartment buildings or neighborhoods and say, how can this Neguinha live in the same building as me? A black woman was impeded from entering her own apartment by two white men. So, again, this is the woman. She lived in this apartment. And I don't know if she's I, I have to read the article again because it's from five years ago. I think she was impeded from coming. She lived there. She had keys to the apartment and everything. And they didn't want to let her in because they couldn't believe that 
someone who looked like her could possibly live in that apartment building, right? Here you have what the racial segregation, what the racial map of Brazil reveals about segregation. This is a piece that I um, I received from, there were a bunch of African-Americans living in like cities like Sao Paulo, Rio, and Salvador while I was still there. And this was a, a African-American woman who shared her experience living in an upper crust neighborhood in Sao Paulo. I think the neighborhood was called Pinheiros. And she talked a little bit about her experience, how, you know, living in this apartment. I forgot. I forgot what I don't know if she was in education. I can't forget. Remember what area, what type of work she was doing. But she was living in Pinheiros. And she was like, just the apartment that she lived in, it was just very few black people in that apartment. I have other African-Americans who have talked about their experiences of living in these ritzy neighborhoods and being one, like one of the very few black people living in the apartment building, right? This was a piece I did back in October of last year. Uh, wow, it's hard to believe that this, this, wow, this is already like, I don't know, maybe seven months ago. And this, you know, I already did a video on this. It says, get out, monkey. In Sao Paulo, the comedian musician Eddie Jr. leaves his apartment after racist attack. The incident triggers protest in front of his apartment building. So he was basically harassed by this woman over here who didn't like seeing him live there. So this is what I'm saying. It's like he has the economic means to live in this apartment. And still there's people who are uncomfortable with his presence in the building. You know, there was... If, if you if you saw this video that I did, it was some months ago, and it was just like, okay, this woman and her and her son came to his apartment building. The guy actually had, I think he had either a broken bottle or a knife in his hand, waiting for this for the comedian to come outside. So you know, yeah, you know, it's the United States that's the real racist country, but it's like, how does this how does this type of thing happen? You know. He's obviously a person of means or he wouldn't be in that apartment building. You know, he's a comedian and a musician. So obviously he earns enough money to live in that apartment. But some people were uncomfortable with their presence. And this is what I'm saying. The videos I've done in the past show these are primarily historically. These have been areas and, and you know, parts of society where people only expect to see other white people living there or taking planes or driving fancy cars. So then when you see a black guy come along that has access to some of these same things, it's like, what is this dude doing here? What is this woman doing here? You know, go back to the favela where you belong, you know, favelas being the, uh, you know, the low, low income, uh, we can say uh, shanty towns, you call them, as people are translated, but these are favelas. And so it's an assumption that a black person is automatically supposed to be from a favela, even if they are or they're not, right? Okay, outlining for death, white, black areas, and redlining of Brazilian cities. Again, the racial segregation in Brazil doesn't compare to how you have black and white neighborhoods in the United States or Latino neighborhoods in that same way. But it is, it can be studied. And Brazil does have a certain level of segregation in the cities according to race, right? This is an intriguing photo here. <laughs> Not even going to get into it. I mean, uh, yeah, I think this the picture says it all. This is, um, I said this earlier today. It's like you get pulled over by some police and the guns are already pointed at you. So common occurrence. So whether the guy whose video I talked about a couple of weeks ago, whether he told the truth or he didn't, this is something that happens all the time in Brazil. So it doesn't really matter if he told the truth or he didn't. This is, um, let me see. I forget what year this video is from, but um, there was a, a, a satire video that was posted on YouTube. And what it is, is that when, let's say, a, a, you know, a vendor or a seller or, you know, insurance agent or whatever, somebody goes to a certain neighborhood in Brazil. And if a black woman opens the door, it's automatically assumed that she must be the maid because how can this black woman live in this nice house? So it says, you know, if, if it's a black woman opening the door, she must be the maid if they're in a, you know, a, you know, a middle class neighborhood. You know, lady opens the door, says, you know, may I speak to the lady of the house? The video satirizes Brazil belief, Brazil's belief that a black woman in a middle class home must be a maid or a cleaning lady. So this was a pretty cool video. This and this was a cartoon, if I'm not mistaken. This is from um, uh, I forget the guy's name. He was uh, he's a real popular artist, who uh, Mauricio Pestana, and he was the I think he's the like the the editor of Hasa Brazil magazine. Hasa Brian 
the only magazine targeted at the Afro-Brazilian population. And this is actually what happened here. He says, I wanted to speak to the owner, you know, the lady, the owner of the house in this case. And she says, you can speak because she's saying, OK, I, I'm the owner of this house. She's like, go ahead. You can talk. This is a, a strip about the uh, the new black middle class. So he says, look, I know the owner. He must trust you very much, but I would like to speak to him personally. You know, so look at her face. It's <laughs> She's obviously not too happy with he just automatically assumed that because she's black, she can't be the owner of this house. And this is something that you get with how black people are treated in Brazil, just constantly treated as, you know, second class citizens. How can this black woman be the owner of this house? So this is what this video is all about here. This is a video and the woman, you know, the woman passes out because she's shocked when she comes to realize that this is really the owner of the home. Right. So this is um, just a little overview of how housing discrimination works in Brazil, whether it's coming from the real estate industry or it's in the attitudes of the people who live in certain neighborhoods and how they're treated, uh, how people perceive their social economic status just because they're black. So this is an introductory art article. I'm definitely going to have to do some other, uh, you know, connected articles about this because this is a topic now, like I said, no matter what area you look at in Brazil, you're going to come across this certain discomfort that people have with seeing black people in certain places. Right. So with that said, I'm going to you know, wrap up this video. Um, if you like this video, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Drop a comment in the comment section, you know, like this video, share this video. Uh, consider subscribing if you've watched more than a couple of videos that you like on this channel. Click on that notification bell so you'll get new videos as I post them. And with that said, I'm going to end the video here and I uh, hope you come to check out my next video.